Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, glad to see many of you back from the last time that we had a session on business. Today we are talking about working for good. How can we serve the last, least and loss through the marketplace? Now, may I just introduce our three speakers? Um, so today, we, first off, we have Dr. Go Wei Leong, who is a friend of mine as well as a general practitioner. He runs a clinic in a low-income neighborhood in Singapore. He also was a co-founder and currently serves as chairman of HealthServe, an NGO that reaches out to underserved foreign workers in Singapore. Um, and of course, you can see Dr. Go on the screen. Good evening, Dr. Go. Yeah. Um, next, we have Associate Professor Dr. Tan Lai Yong, who teaches in the National University of Singapore. As you can see on the screen again, a uh, great uh, photograph of the sunset. I understand that he's also a keen photographer. Prior to, to teaching in NUS, he worked amongst poor rural communities in Yunnan, China, for 14 years. Our next speaker. Did you know that maids, uh, they have to pay about six to eight months of their salary to an agent in order to come to Singapore or many of the other countries that they go to work? So now our next speaker, James Quack, addresses the inequalities of the foreign domestic worker labor market through his maid agency in Singapore called My Helper. He was previously the executive director of World Vision Singapore and uh, may, and just a virtual um, welcome to our three uh, speakers, Dr. Go, Dr. Tan, and Brother James Quack. Uh, for me, my name is Galvin. I'm a young gatekeeper with Gatekeepers Singapore for a few years. Uh, just to set the context, I think we, as Christians, we have a lot of um, seminars and we have a lot of programs and talks where we hear about social justice and righteousness increasingly nowadays. And on the other hand, we also have increasing number of uh, seminars and talks and discussions on the marketplace and how Christians can um, serve God, right? Through their vocation in the workplace, whether as employers or as employees. But today what we want to do is to connect the two together, which is why the topic is called Serving the Last Least and Lost Through the Marketplace. And this is also why we have invited our three speakers who uh, are involved to some extent in various types of social service and social action, but at the same time also have degrees, varying degrees of course, of, uh, of experience in the marketplace, right, in various capacities. So this today is our central focus. And we felt that this would add to the add value to the current discussion, especially for those of you in Singapore, uh, you're well aware that there's a lot of focus on some of our most vulnerable communities nowadays, such as the foreign construction workers, the foreign, do the foreign domestic workers, and of course, many of our own local communities. Uh, that being said, um, I also like to draw your attention to the fact that we have a global audience tonight, uh, or perhaps um, this morning, if you are halfway around the world. Um, so the last time round, we had people from as far as Africa, United States, and Europe. Uh, today uh, remains to be seen, but definitely we have a fair number of uh, foreign guests with us tonight, and we welcome you. Uh, today's discussion is not specifically about Singaporean issues, although we will, of course, refer to them given the experience of our speakers. So now, thanks for bearing with the long introduction. Uh, how we're going to do this is I've asked our three speakers to prepare a few opening thoughts, not too long, just a couple of minutes, just to share what they think of this topic before we go straight into a very exciting and I believe very eclectic discussion. So uh, let us begin with uh, Dr. Tan to just share some of his thoughts and I believe he does have some photographs as well to share with us. Now over to you, Dr. Tan. Hello, my name is Lai Yong. Uh, Wei Long and I are, were classmates in medical school. Uh, we, I worked for 10 years in Singapore from 1985 to 1996. So tonight, I have the pleasure of this idea of working for good, uh, urban lessons from rural communities. Next slide. So my family and I had the privilege of working in uh, 
rural China. This is the part of China we live in, okay, where China meets uh, Myanmar and Vietnam and Laos. So I have Filipino friends who shared farming knowledge and because I'm a doctor, I shared healthcare knowledge. We started training what we call barefoot doctors, village doctors. Village doctors are uh, maybe young people, 20 to 30 years old, with maybe primary six or secondary three education. This was in the 90s, when in the mountains, uh, there was uh, just no healthcare. So we trained them to stitch wounds, to deliver babies, to give vaccination. And when we went there, uh, this is the 1990s and Chinese, uh, the economy then haven't really opened up, up in Yunnan. And when they asked me, what is your aim in training village doctors? Uh, we had several aims, competence, communication. And one of the things that uh, we shared with the government officials was that we want to teach the village doctors how to make money. And they were shocked. I said, what? They're supposed to serve the people. I said, yeah, you can serve the people and you need to make money and make it honestly because then there is sustainability of healthcare. So tonight I'd like to share about the importance of employment and what makes a job good in the marketplace. Uh, I'm in a university now and often students as well as parents ask what makes a good job? Salary? I say no, no, no. What makes a job good? What values do you bring into the marketplace? And what values do you create in the marketplace? And I remember a farmer taught me, I was looking at the fruits, lovely fruits in Yunnan, and said, wow, what a good harvest. And then this wise farmer very gently told me that the clever farmer may be looking at the fruits and the sale of the harvest, but the wise farmer always look at the roots because that's where next year's harvest will come. Dr. Go, just to share with us some of your thoughts on this topic, working for good. Yes, so um, well, thanks again for this invitation. I think, you know, the, um, the title for today's webinar is so powerful, is it? Working for good. Uh, and I was just thinking, since this is the first time coming to a gatekeeper's uh, um, uh, webinar or meeting, I was thinking about gates and what it means when gates sometimes do separate us from those at the margins. We are talking about the last, lost, and least. And if you like this photo, uh, this photograph is it's about uh, taken about uh, two weeks ago or two or three weeks ago. Uh, and this is my social worker staff, uh, two of them from our social services team. And uh, this is taken in Geelang where uh, many of the workers live. These workers, uh, the workers here on the other side of this gate, and by the way, this gate, this photograph captured my attention because uh, it's such a retro gate, isn't it? It's uh, one of these collapsible gates that you don't see nowadays. You notice the two uh, padlocks there. And on the people on the other side of the gate, from Yvonne and Daniel, who are my uh, staff team members, or my colleagues, on the other side, you see two migrant workers, two Bangladeshis, uh, with their face masks on. And, um, and these two guys are really, we went to visit them because they had called our hotline. Uh, they are what they call special pass workers. And special pass workers are folks who have uh, uh, lost their, well, in the middle of settling a case, it could be a work injury or a salary dispute. And they can't work now, they've got no salary. And, Many of them during COVID-19 uh, have been evicted by their landlords because uh, the, uh, the landlords have decided that, you know, we can't have so many people because of government regulation, uh, so they get evicted. So they are now uh, left without food and without um, uh, money. And so we, we go there to give them food, uh, give them some care packs. And actually what Yvonne and Daniel are doing now to so help settle the landlord's uh, rent, okay, the rent for them. So this is what we do. So, you know, um, COVID-19 has not been that great leveler that many of us have suggested is around the world. Indeed, re really is the poor and the marginalized who are most affected. In this case, our two 
Bangladeshi brothers here. And, uh, the, and in many ways, this pandemic uh, has opened the eyes of many of us Christians to notice the Lazarus who are sitting at the gate, as found the story in Luke 16. Uh, if you remember the story in Luke 16, uh, in scene one, right, this rich man dressed in all his nice purple clothes and all his enjoying good food. And then Lazarus, on the other hand, is described as sitting at the gate uh, as a beggar covered with sores and then being fed, you know, longing to be fed uh, with the crumbs. And then from the rich man's table, and then the dogs even licked his wounds. And then scene two, both of them die, and then the rich man ends up in hell, and Lazarus in the bosom of uh, Abraham. Now the rich man seems to be punished not for what he did or what he had as a rich man, but for what he did not do. And uh, you know, I was just thinking that the rich man must have gone in and out of the gate every day, and surely he must have noticed Lazarus, or perhaps he did not. And maybe Lazarus had faded into the scenery or the landscape. So perhaps what we really need today, I think, which I will go into, is that we need an attentive presence. We need to know, be able to notice those people who are living around us, uh, and we live in the presence of one another. And this part of common humanity, uh, human solidarity that we we, uh, we, we share joy together, but we also suffer together. You know, we suffer the same virus, the same lockdown, the same inconveniences, but again, with different outcomes and, and, and um, stories. So I think this story of Lazarus teaches us that there's no immunity to the virus or escape. And in Singapore, there's some 300,000 uh, construction, uh, construction workers or people or uh, low-wage workers living in dormitories. And we you know, I think they are in our midst, and you know, it's fantastic that so many of us in Singapore now uh, see Lazarus uh, at the gate. Uh, and so we really have to work together for good, and it cannot be done together. It, can, it cannot be done alone. We have to do it together. And I really want to explore some of these things, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to uh, explore the idea of togetherness through uh, covenantal relationship lens versus a contractual lens, which we can talk about later on. Um, when I first started my mid agency about six years ago, there were about 230,000 foreign domestic workers in Singapore. Today, there are about 260,000. You can see the number is growing and uh, it's projected that very soon we will have about 300,000 foreign domestic workers in our midst. Let me tell you a story about one of those uh, women. Uh, this is uh, Amui. Her name is Amui. She's a mother of two, two girls. Her husband was an alcoholic and uh, the husband died of liver sclerosis. There were no jobs available for her uh, in Myanmar and uh, she was struggling to make ends meet. So she came to Singapore to work as a maid. Now with her salary after working for many years, maybe seven years or so, she managed to put her eldest daughter, Kim, through university. Uh, Kim was a good student and today she is working for the American Embassy in Yangon. The younger daughter, Piki, is uh, doing her university uh, right now. Now, Amy worked for my family as a helper for four years. And I visited her some time back in Yangon. With the money that she has uh, earned working in Singapore, today she owns a small little shop, a very small shop, very humble shop, right? Providing uh, printing, scanning, and photocopy services. Her daughter, Piki, uh, I think there is a previous slide. Can you see her slide? Can I have the next slide? Uh, this is her daughter, Piki. Piki being a little bit more educated than her mother. <laughs> she helps her with the translation and uh, uh, working with all the uh, photocopy machines and such. And uh, in addition, she has a small grocery shop. Uh, uh, can you switch into the, the other slide, please? Yeah, selling uh, frozen food, ice cream. It's a very small little shop uh, next to her house, actually. So the future now looks uh, brighter. Not very, very bright, but brighter for Amy and her family because she worked really hard and uh, Singapore provided her with that opportunity. Uh, about six years ago, 
just before she went back to retire, Amy, Amy came to me and uh, she said, Sir, why don't you start a maid agency? At that time, I was still the executive director of World Vision. Yeah, it's finishing up my term. So her question was quite stunning to, to say the least. Who, me? <laughs> she must be kidding, right? Asking me, say, Sir, you may start a maid agency. So I asked her, Why? Why did you ask me to start a maid agency? So she explained to me, you know, every Sunday she goes to church and uh, she's like a big mama in the church. All, this, all the young girls will come crying on her shoulders and, uh, and she has to comfort them. And uh, invariably they face two problems. Either they have bad employers or they have bad agents. If they have bad employers and they have bad agents, there will be two years of misery for the girls. At the time, I was uh, contemplating the new direction in my life, and God was leading me towards a ministry towards the widows, the orphans, and the foreigners in our land. And I started looking seriously into the maid industry, and I found some disturbing facts. All right? uh, the maids face uh, many, many challenges, such as high placement fees, physical and verbal abuse, and in various forms of uh, maltreatment. So to cut a long story short, about six and a half years ago, I started this uh, maid agency called My Helper. Now this little story maybe as a starter can provoke some questions uh, for discussions later on. Like, what are the challenges that foreign domestic workers face? What are some challenges that employers face? Uh, and of course, speaking from the point of view as an employment agency, what are some of the challenges that we face? And our challenges have an impact on employers and all the rest of the value chain. And uh, her story will also give us the occasion to ask some questions on how to break the poverty cycle. Uh, for, for a case like Imui, she managed to break the poverty cycle and I think she's on the way because her two daughters are, one, one is graduated and one, the other one is almost about to graduate. Right, so she's actually much better off than uh, most of the other girls that we know. And uh, the other question that we can discuss further perhaps is how do we break the poverty cycle through enterprise like what Amy is doing? Yeah? And, uh, and the last and I would say the most important, I hope that some of you will ask those questions, uh, is uh, we can talk about what we can do better to protect the foreign domestic workers in our midst. So before we get too deep into the specifics, right, maybe of some of these issues of justice and combined with the marketplace, just wanted to pull us back a bit and understand from each of you, how did you get started on, on these journeys? Um, I'm sure that this is an expression of your faith. It's an expression of your discipleship. Uh, and I remember when we had our own discussion just last week, um, many of you are keen to emphasize that you're not heroes, right? You're, just working out your Christian calling. So perhaps I just want to hear from our speakers a bit about your convictions and what makes you um, do what you do, right? As compared to just anyone saying, hey, I've got a big passion for justice and I want to do it, right? What, what's the difference that we are believers here? I became a Christian in 1974 when I was 14 years old because my teacher uh, led us in Bible reading. This was Sigap Secondary School, a secular school. And it's amazing. So the Bible, God's word, shaped my life. And uh, I come from a church, very nice church, that always uh, tells us that sort and light, okay, that Jesus, God saved us, call us out of the world. We are not part of the world. He sends us into the world. Okay, so this is a picture I have in my background. It's a privilege that I have. I'm staying on the university campus and every morning I look out and I see this. People think it's a cross. Mm -hmm. It's not a cross. Actually, it's a Singapore Telecom's communication tower. But it always reminds me, Christ in me, Christ in the world. And when you enter the world, you enter because of Christ's love. You will meet the rich, the poor, the wealthy and the weak. And we bring authenticity to this relationship because God loves each one of us. And just as a follow on to that, Brother Layong, why, how, why did you end up in China, right? For such a long period of time? Wei Dong and I were in medical school 
even in medical school, we, we knew that uh, being a doctor is a privilege. Education is a privilege. God has given us this precious opportunity to be trained. And in our cell groups, we sort of uh, came to some kind of uh, dream that some of us will stay in Singapore, earn the money, and some of us will go overseas. Okay. And uh, well, I, uh, the Lord placed in our hearts, my wife and I, we went overseas. And it was supposed to be about three or four years, but we stayed a long time. And after a while, those who stay in Singapore, like way down, would look at me and say, you seem to be having a very nice time, you know, and we are working very, very hard here. Can we switch? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's God's grace. Uh, we uh, wanted to bring our skills to low-income areas. So we don't work in a low-income part of Singapore. And uh, we job search, basically. My wife and I job search, no calling, uh, no lightning out of the blue. We job search during our vacation. We visited Sri Lanka, India, different places and asked the question, Lord, do you want us to work here? And so I think missions, whether it's a marketplace mission or uh, cross-cultural missions, missions is an expression of discipleship. Mission is always an expression of personal and corporate discipleship. And uh, a calling may affirm that, but we live to be disciples. Thanks for sharing. What about Brother Wei Leong, right? Yeah, I think I'll take off from, well, so Lion's story, yeah, that's true, you know, in, during university, uh, we're together and somehow, uh, you know, uh, okay, Lord, here am I, send him. And so about four, <laughs> four or five of us in the cell group, right, uh, in the fellowship. And really, you know, so Lion went and the rest of us stayed back. And, you know, in those days, uh, I've never heard of the word uh, social justice. I mean, it wasn't invoked then or no one talked about it. Um, and so I went into uh, medical, uh, after graduation, into the workplace or the marketplace as a GP, uh, all the way in a low-income place, a low-income neighborhood. But you know, sometimes very soon, uh, sometimes money can get the better of you, and it did in my own life. And uh, so soon, even though I was in a low-income neighborhood, it, there was sort of a sacred secular divide. Uh, but... Uh, uh, the Lord sort of, I rediscovered Jesus in uh, 95 in Mongolia when I you know, saw the mission field was much larger there. Uh, by the time Lion was already uh, in the field. Um, and after that, you know, to cut a long story short, I, I met another chap uh, who is my co-founder of HealthServe. He's in Xinyong. We had lots of coffee together, chatting. And then we noticed uh, the people, uh, you know, around us. So... That was in 2006. Uh, one day, early 2006, I told him, you know, Shin Yong, don't you think that there's so many migrant workers here in our midst? Uh, he said, yeah, yeah. And I said, why, how about starting a clinic for them? And that's how it started. Uh, no big dreams, uh, no sense of wanting to conquer uh, these injustices around us, but just to having noticed uh, someone who is different and I said, you know, I'm sure they have problems accessing medical care and I'm sure they don't have enough money. And so when we went in, we started a simple uh, uh, GP clinic. Uh, Shin Yong is a businessman and uh, I don't have this business sense, right? But he could see the opportunity, so to speak, for missions. And uh, so with both of us working, so me as a, a medical professional and he as a businessman, also into missions, uh, it was a fantastic combination because we complemented each other in terms of strengths uh, and, and weaknesses also. And so when we went in, uh, all I had in mind was really the medical part to help them. But soon we realized that we had to do something much more holistic, more integral. Uh, we looked into the social aspects uh, and we realized that we found out a horror that uh, many of the migrant workers paid something to, from $3,000 to even Ten or fifteen thousand dollars to an agent, just to get a job that pays them maybe eight hundred or thousand dollars a month, uh, and then with lots of deductions and all. And uh, so after that, we started social services, legal advisory, uh, and today we we also run uh, uh, research. You know? So really, it's a journey, I would say, in terms of social justice. And then as I did this, I began to understand our God, who is a God of justice. I began to explore the Bible, you know, 
uh, the Micro 6 8 started to come up, or, or Amos 5. And so, so I think it was a real journey. And I'm still discovering together with people who, whom I come across. How about you, uh, Brother James? Yeah, allow me to add on to uh, Lai Yong and uh, Wei Leong, yeah? Um, just like uh, Wei Leong, this term social, social justice is also an alien concept huh, when we were much younger. Huh? We were just reading the Bible and going to church and doing things like that. And uh, for starting of this mid agency, like Lai Yong said, I mean, you know, our case is like no big flashes of light. Uh, there was no strong like clarity say wow god called me to do this yeah uh, but what i know is this uh in world vision we i travel quite a fair bit to our projects and these are usually to the poor countries and in these travels i learned two simple things uh the first thing is that the poor stays poor not because they are lazy <laughs> but because they have no money they have no capital to do anything because world vision we do a lot of microfinance too because if the poor were really lazy, then how do you explain that there are 260,000 women who have left the comfort of their homes to come here and work in Singapore, a strange place, you know, and I'm not sure whether it's safe or not safe. You know, why do they come here? So let me give you an example. Yeah? In Myanmar, if you are a graduate, you earn something like 100 US dollars. Right? Uh, that's about 140 Singapore dollars. But if you come here and work as a maid, uh, you can get about 500, sometimes 600, sometimes $700. In two years, you can earn something like about $12,000. And that's a lot of capital for them. All right. Now, you, just, you have to remember that almost all the helpers who come and work here, uh, very few of them are graduates. Most of them maybe secondary too. So don't even talk about $140. Huh? Maybe when they start work in Myanmar, they earn maybe $50, $60. So suddenly, if they come here, they can work and they can earn five, six hundred dollars $600. That's a big jump for them. All right. So the poor is not, they're poor not because they are lazy, but because they have no capital and they are here seeking for capital. The second thing that I realized during my travels is that uh, when a family faces a, a dire situation, it's always the women who rise up. Uh, to face the challenge. Uh, sorry, I don't know what happened to the guys. <laughs> Usually when I go to the villages, it's always the women working very, very hard, you know. And uh, to the point that when the girls are at the wit's end, you know, not, not sure what to do, uh, then they have to start thinking and hearing about, oh, my so-and-so, my friend went to Singapore and they came back safe and sound in one piece and they earned so much money, you know. And uh, they also are prepared to make the sacrifice. Uh, to come to a strange land to, to earn a living, to support their family. And very often they have to give up taking care of their own one-year-old, two-year-old children to come to Singapore to take care of a family with children, you know. You just imagine how they feel, you know. So in, in World Vision, when I'm helping the poor, it is, we're doing a great job, you know, but we're helping people far and wide. But when Amy comes to talk to me, it is up close and personal. Uh, it's no more helping the poor out there. You know? Suddenly, to my horror, I realized that, wow, I didn't even know that there were 230,000 helpers in Singapore at that time until I started doing my research. I just know that there are many of them, you know. And then now to hear her up close and personal telling me all their personal stories of pain and suffering, that make, made a lot of a difference. And that's how I, 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 I started to seriously consider doing this as a ministry uh, without the flashes of lightning that Lai Yong mentioned. Thanks for sharing with us uh, how My Helper came about. And I think you've all touched on some of the spiritual convictions, right, which have led you on this journey. Now, in recent, the recent weeks and months, uh, in the whole of the world, but also here in Singapore, we have faced a lot of issues with the COVID-19 pandemic. And as Brother Weilong pointed out, it has affected people disproportionately. In particular, in Singapore, we've seen a lot of focus on issues with the foreign construction workers. But also, there have also been increasing reports of issues with foreign domestic workers that are not so uh, well known, right? Because the media spotlight's not on them. So I just wanted to ask our panelists over here, 
with with so much uh, attention on these groups of people at this point of time, uh, what do you, what message do you do you think the public um, and the public in Singapore should take home with them? Right, I mean it's a very rare opportunity. So perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, Brother Wei Leong. I mean your the organization that you're chairman of uh, has been in the spotlight. I mean in a good way in the last couple of months. Uh, any insights to share from that? Yeah, I think uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Gavin. You know, the COVID-19 really has opened up many things, isn't it? And one of them is the problem of uh, isolation and individualism and stuff. And yet, I think for many of us, uh, you know, uh, you know it, 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 as you mentioned, it affects us at different uh, levels. At HealthServe, uh, when we first started, uh, I was horrified to find out that the contracts given to many of the workers uh, are very one-sided. I mean, you know, in MOM, our Ministry of Manpower, the, there's, there's lots of uh, safeguards and, uh, you know, laws and legislation to protect uh, the, the low-wage, vulnerable worker. But in reality, the enforcement is very difficult. And, um, and so, you know, we, we view everything through a contract. And many workers sign contracts without even understanding a word of it. And I was thinking, you know, perhaps uh, what COVID has uh, uh, opened up to me at least is that one of the key problems is that we view everything through a lens of a contract, a contractual relationship. Uh, you know, in, as a body of Christ, as uh, fellow believers, you know, we have a covenantal uh, relationship with God. Our God is a covenant God, isn't it? And uh, what if, I was just thinking, what if we uh, see every relationship as a covenantal relationship instead of a, a contractual relationship? And that would make a difference. Uh, and let me explain. So if you think of a covenantal relationship when you relate with a fellow human being, someone made the image of God, whether he acknowledges God or not, right? he still made the image of God. If we, we approach him from a covenantal relationship, then that covenant you know, covenant is really, we don't really, it's not so time bound. It is about honor. It is about the other person. It's, it's almost free of specifics, isn't it? Uh, somewhat akin to a marriage vow. You know, we don't talk about marriage contracts, right? But uh, when, we have a, uh, when we employ a domestic worker or a foreign uh, migrant worker, uh, we give a contract. And contract he has to fulfill. And I think therein lies the core problem. Uh, uh, that there is a contractual. So it helps us. One of the things that we try to do is, can we do more of a covenantal relationship? For and we, sometimes we call it a more uh, relational framework versus a transactional framework, and that has uh, helped us. Uh, so I think maybe in our practice, how does that look like? Is something we can discuss more from a more covenantal relational point. Would you be able to give us some examples of this? I mean, it sounds intriguing. Uh, just how could it look like you know, to be more relational, covenantal? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think uh, when you are more covenantal, uh, uh, it actually forms the basis for neighborhoods right? or being neighborly. Uh, when I view my patient, okay, that comes in, you know, a very often the migrant workers will say, "Doctor, I love health sir because." Your medicine very good. We always cure. We always cure. Uh, I many many headache, but I my many many headache cure very fast. Very good, sir. And I was wondering. I say why? He said no, but very good, very good. Then we realize in talking to our uh, people, the, our brothers who see us, that actually you know when they go to see a GP or uh, or the polyclinic or anybody else, it's exactly the same medicine. But why is it different? And we find out that really it is not this, it's not the medicine. You know, the medicine is a certain standard. It's, we always have the same standard. But what he's saying that he values is this community, the sense that we treat him as a fellow human being. I call them my name. And for many migrant workers who come to our clinic, I say, hey, brother, I mean, how are you? I mean, how are you today? You know. This is probably the few, one of the few times he's called by name and acknowledged by a Singaporean. And uh, for me, 
or many of the volunteers who are Singaporeans, any Singaporean, whether you're engineer, doctor, or student, or housewife, to call a migrant worker, sit down with him, share a meal with him, and share coffee together on the same table, it blows their mind. And this is covenantal relationship. But in a very transactional, I see that I perform within a framework, uh, within checklists. As long as I give you medicine, you cure your headache, that's fine. But here in the covenantal relationship, I see him more. And then I, I, I want to learn from him as much as he can learn from me. I can receive from him as much as he can receive from me. So that's really what we try to practice as a covenantal relationship in our whole set, in our setting. Mm. This definitely reminds me of last month's dialogue when Brother Philip Ng shared with us that you know, the whole world knows us by numbers, right? Digital numbers. Uh, God is the only one who knows us, who calls us by name. And I think that point really resonates I think, with, all, with all of us here who believe in God. And um, just on this point of, of developing relationships, regardless of the vehicle, maybe I'd like to ask um, Brother Lyong or James, um, how do you do that with the people that you're serving, right, in different capacities? Response to uh, Ray Leong, huh? Um, the COVID-19 has brought awareness to a very big group of foreign workers. In Singapore, we divide our people into foreign workers, the male, and foreign domestic workers, the, all the females. Yeah? Uh, there's a big shaking in the male sector. So all the attention right now is on the male. And the foreign domestic worker is they are all keeping a very low profile. In fact, they cannot come out. Government has given a directive. They cannot come out, <laughs> stay at home, don't go out at all. You know? uh, but we long made a very good point about this covenantal relationship. Um, so a lot depends. Huh? Um, some employers see the helpers as just an extra pair of hands and legs. So it's a the transactional contractual kind of thing. I pay you X dollars, you do the work. I have one employee who told me, hey James, I pay my helper by the minute and I expect her to work by the minute. You know, I was thinking, oh my goodness, uh, the salary was $450. She worked 16 hours a day. Basically, her salary was just one hour, one dollar. <laughs> you know, and then she was expecting the poor girl to say, I will expect you to work every minute of the day. You know, uh, so that is one spectrum where you have uh, employers who really are transactional. But on the other hand, I have seen many, many good employers in Singapore huh, who have actually done the same thing on that covenant, covenantal relationship with their helpers, not in those terms, and sometimes without even knowing it. It's just being, whether they're Christians or not, it, they just feel that it is the right thing huh, to do. But I like to play the devil's advocate with Elon for a while. You know, you know if you see the, 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 the patient for the three minutes, huh, you can show that compassion. and. Uh, no. But for my employer, sometimes it is difficult no? for, for them uh, throughout the day uh, uh, when the helper grades them <laughs> on their nerves, spoil their expensive things and things like that. So even the very saintly Christians uh, sometimes get very, very frustrated. So it's very difficult, uh, I must acknowledge here, that it is very, very difficult to maintain that kind of covenantal uh, relationship even for the helpers and the employers. Yeah. So sorry to add that to you. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really tough also. Even in our context, it's not easy. Yeah, but I think in community, uh, we can encourage each other. And then that's why uh, the, if more of us do it in different spheres and different sectors, it makes it easier. So what I'm saying is we need to change. Okay, there should be a major cultural shift within the whole Christian community so that it becomes norm. The, the more is norm, right? Uh, it's easier for all of us to do it. Uh, we don't have to think too much, right? It's like second nature, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, I think something we need to shift. I think we, we can slowly do it. And there are enough of us to, to shift it, I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Brother Layong, I mean, you came back from China quite a few years ago. And um, of course, you re-entered the Christian community here. And just thinking about what Brother Wei Leong said, you know, that our Christian community, we need to change the way we think, especially about some of these groups of people. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts of that, because I know you're very close also to, to quite a lot of these uh, the migrant workers yourself. Mm. 
I think uh, the Lord allows events in our life, in our society, because the Lord loves us so much to change us. If we go back to read Psalms 13, Psalms 13, how long, O Lord? How long? How long? How long? David was in despair, Psalms 1-3. And then David cries out, look to me. O God, look to me. My enemies are becoming stronger. And when David says, how long? How long? How long? Then he say, ask God, God, look to me. And what's the next phrase? Give light to my eyes. We ask God to look at us so that our outlook will change and should change. Uh, I've volunteered and work uh, as a doctor among foreign construction workers in Singapore on and off over the past 25 years. And sort and like, there are Christians uh, and good people in our society have brought a lot of good improvement to the foreign worker situation in Singapore. Uh, believe me you, dorms have become much better over the past 10 years, much, much better. Okay, When Wei Dong and I first entered a dorm 10, 12 years ago, it was dirty, crowded. Uh, now we can go to dorms and uh, we can actually feel at home. So there's a spectrum, right? And then the Christians need always to measure ourselves by God's standards of justice and love. And when we move on, okay, I think here we learn what Philippians say, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is excellent, affirm these things. So there is great inequality through the world. There is inequality in Singapore. Part of our Christian witness is to critique the injustice as well as affirm the justice. And how we do that, each one, each family, each company will have to do it as a response in discipleship. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, so i just like to remind our participants in the audience, there is a Q&A tab, which you can submit your questions uh, through, and we'll endeavor to, to answer uh, most of them. Uh, also, uh, you don't have to raise your hands. I know there's a raise hand feature, but um, you don't have to raise your hands. You can actually just submit your questions on the Q&A um, tab. Yeah, now we've, we've talked quite a bit about the problems and how it's increasingly obvious, especially in the COVID pandemic. Uh, what about talking about some of the solutions, some of the constructive part of it? And I'm just thinking about you, brother James. Um, you decided after your, your own mate asked you why not start a mate agency and you took up that idea to actually start a mate agency. So since we also have a marketplace focus for this session, uh, what were some of your considerations uh, in doing so? Why, why not maybe just do a, a ministry, right, to, to mates? Why do you decide to start the, the agency? And what were some of the challenges from a business perspective when you were doing so? Coming from my world vision background, so we are helping the poor, helping the down and the lost and the least is not something new to us, yeah? So when I heard about this need, I thought about it carefully. World Vision is also very strong in advocacy. So one obvious route to take was to advocate for the workers, for the, help, for the helpers, uh, tell the stories and then uh, create social awareness. But then I realized very quickly that, hey, there are people doing that for the past 10, 20 years, you know, and the situation that my helper explained to me, seems that it has not changed for the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, in fact, we have one veteran who told me, say, hey James, last time are the good old days. <laughs> you know, when they were making tons of money, you know, you were telling me good old days, but today, well, now things are very difficult, you know. So I got an inkling of what he meant. Yeah? Last time it was very easy to make money out of, on the backs of the workers, uh, of, the, of the domestic workers. So that was something I considered. Uh, uh, of starting an NGO, starting an advocacy, and things like that. I, after much thought, I descended on one simple idea. Instead of telling people what 
they should do, why not just do it? So I decided to start a med agency uh, to demonstrate that it is possible to be profitable without being exploitative. All right, because if I'm an NGO, then I need to look for look for funds and look for look for donations and things like that, isn't it? Yeah, so that's a different game, a huh? different different set of uh, uh, operation. But I decided that I want this to be a for-profit social enterprise. And uh, the first thing I did was to register my company as a, as a social enterprise. Uh, when I went to register myself, I think those guys were, didn't know what to do with me because they have never heard of a mid agency registering as a social enterprise. Yeah, so I was the first one. And then what I wanted to do was to demonstrate that we can be profitable without being exploitative. Now, there are about 3,000 uh, registered employment agencies in Singapore. Out of these, 1,000 are active in the foreign domestic worker sec segment. And out of this, only about 500 are really, really active. So I was thinking that if I can demonstrate that we can be profitable and not exploitative, then we can master and encourage and bring more people into this, share this vision with more agencies. And then when they see that, yeah, it's possible, then they may shed some of the old white skin, you know, and they say, hey, yeah, why not we do this? Because many of them do tell me uh, that they don't really feel good about what they have been doing, actually. Uh, they know that they've been profiting off the backs and the sweat of the, the workers, you know, but they say, this is how the industry has been for so long, you know. So, it is the market practice. I still remember when I talked to my first supplier in Myanmar, you know, I asked him, why do you charge the workers seven to nine months of their salary? He said, I don't know. My friends are doing it. <laughs> you know, so that was a very silly answer, but that was the reality of it, you know. And they were charging the girls so many thousand dollars just to do that, you know. And uh, there's no reason for it. That as we sat down to do the sums, we realized that, hey, it can be done at a lower cost. Not that it should be free, but at a lower cost, right? So nine months, we started off five, six years ago, down from nine months down to five months. And today we are doing only four months, right? Uh, Singapore, one month, and the, the other side, three months. So it is possible. In fact, we, we hope that someday we can bring it down to two months, three months, you know, as little as possible uh, for the girls, all right? So it is possible, even at that kind of... Uh, uh, business operation can still be profitable. So it is uh, something that I want to, where I'm challenging yeah, uh, uh, my fellow uh, employment agencies to look into. Yeah. And in the process of doing that, I would suppose that you might be upsetting the market as well. Uh, and just want to understand, could that also have been a challenge? Okay, right? okay that is a very important point because uh, I had a, uh, a friend, a counselor, uh, who, who advised me when I first started. He said, James, if you were to, uh, if you want to be a do-gooder, you can make it free, right? Uh, for for every all the girls to come in free, you know. Then very soon, uh, I'm so called undercutting the market, isn't it? Then I'll be rocking the boat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we decided not to do that, right? So we were charging them less, but we're not charging them below market rate or something like that. Yeah, um, I'm not saying below market rate. We're charging them a reasonable uh, amount, uh, but what we do with the profit is something else, right? So we do make some profit, but what we do with the profit, whether we put it in our own pocket and uh, just lavish it on ourselves, or we return it back to the girls, which is what we did. Yeah, that's why we are a social enterprise. So whatever profit we do, we plow back into the welfare benefits and protection of the domestic helpers. So that's something that is below the radar and nobody will fault us on that. Now, um, Brother Wei Leong, on the other hand, you started a, um, well, a non-commercial organization, right? It's an NGO uh, called HealthStar. So that's a pretty different model. And I just want to understand uh, what was your thought behind deciding on how it would operate um, and how it would be staffed and so on. Sure. Uh, but before that, I'm, I think I see Lyong's hand going up. Maybe Lyong wants to respond to James. Sure, you can. Okay, that. thank you, Wei Long. Uh, we work as a team. Uh, <laughs> just now we introduced that this is intergenerational. Okay, and uh, I should uh, be frank and say that James, Wei Long, myself, we are of the climb the hill and now we are 
uh, almost 60. What I'm going to say is that in the short term, okay, you learn to love what you do. So when we started working, we are given a job. So we learn to love it. Whether it's saikang, whether it's admin, whether it's writing reports, learn to love what you do. But the passion must burn. Okay. Then you do it with honesty, diligence, as unto the Lord. In the long run, as what James has done, as what Wei Dong has done, we learn to do what we love. When the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? it is the righteousness not as a legalistic standard, but it's a righteousness that expresses God's amazing love. Okay. So keep yourself from the thorns and the transition of the world and then move on so that you can in your circle, whether it's media, dance, healthcare, logistics, supply, you learn your skills well, learn to love what you do today and then go on. Keep aiming to do one day what you love. Okay. So what I may want to say is that uh, Market competition is very real. Capitalism is real. Okay. Uh, when we started our village clinics, as long as we were not running the clinics on subsidies, but on low cost, efficiency, good service, when they succeed, the competitors don't whine and complain. But if we give foreign money, donated money, and build them fancy clinics, give them subsidy for free medicine, and when they do well, the local clinics will say, it's unfair. You got money from outside and you undercut me. So even at the village level, when there were village clinics all over, we taught them good costing, efficiency, don't let your medicine go expire, have some inventory, right? Think. And then when their clinics succeed, the competitors don't come and say you were unfair. Okay. So what I want to say is, uh, God's righteousness is such that there are principles in the world. So profit maximization is economic principle. Capitalism is economic principle. But like fire, okay, the saying is true. Fire is a good servant but a bad master. For me, it's the same. Profit maximization, KPIs, and capitalism, they are good servants but they are not my master. I use them, they don't use me. Oh, thanks, Lyong. So I'll just take it, I'll, I'll blend uh, your and yours and Lyong's, uh, you know, take it from there. Uh, you know, HealthServe, uh, our model is different in, in many ways. Uh, we, are, I, uh, we are a charity with IPC status at the moment. But when we started, it was a very simple, uh, volunteer run clinic and uh, we wanted a community and we did as we grew we came to a point where uh, all my friends uh, all the donations from my own circle of friends uh, wasn't enough to sustain because you know there was more and more demand and we realized that more and more uh, uh, migrant workers needed the help uh, how do you scale up now we are caught uh, in this uh, conundrum, right? Or well, these two poles, you know, to expand, to scale up or not. I mean, the, you know, so to scale up, but to what extent, then what would you lose? And we were agonizing. At the end, we felt that uh, we'll decide, we've decided to scale up and then uh, try to hold the tension. And I think this tension is real. Okay, I think for, for those of you who are starting new, uh, something new or social enterprise, there's always this tension. And, uh, we, we are not uh, oblivious to it or we don't run away from it, but we take pains to address it, to confront it. Uh, yeah, now with IPC, for example, how do we not uh, be so, uh, you know, I mean, all the SOPs are important. They help us uh, be excellent in what we do, but how do at the same time uh, within these transactions, all right, and SOPs, keep a spiritual core, keep your values, keep uh, a relational framework over and above a transactional framework, which we have to, you know, yeah. So I think the trellis that holds us is important, 
But more importantly, is the community, the values that drive us. Yeah. So, so, but, but it's been a wonderful journey. And I think uh, the Lord is just always growing us as we hold this tension. And when we see people as who they are from a covenantal relationship, then we are able to hold this. So, that, that's, so the model is, is such, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now we have a couple of questions for Brother James uh, regarding your business, My Helper. Um, so as a social enterprise, how do you measure your social impact? Um, what are your metrics? You mentioned earlier about plowing back profits to the helpers and I think some people are just think, are wondering about what, what does this look like? Do you have some examples? Uh, okay, we are a social enterprise, but uh, I must confess that I don't have so much time to measure all those metrics. I can, do, I can share with you uh, some, some nuggets. Um, the best measure of our social enterprise is Sunday. Sunday is my best time, best day of the week. Sunday is when all the helpers come and visit me. Not all, of course, those who are available. And when they come, they come with a smile on their face and they say, thank you for giving me a nice employer, a good employer. Thank you. And it is the best time is when they come to my office and then if they have a problem, they confide in us and then we talk to them, we tell them how they can solve their problem. And we do that every Sunday. You know, that is the best time of my week when they come and then some of them call me daddy. <laughs> they haven't come to the stage of call me, calling me grandpa yet, but some call me daddy. <laughs> yeah. Now, we put in certain... Uh, benefits and welfare for the girls other than what we normally do of course when the girls are in trouble we will definitely respond to help them etc etc but just to name a few things that we do for the girls uh, if the girls work for one year with one employer we give them a hundred dollar cash bonus all right uh, and we also write a nice letter to the employer hoping that they will also do the same and if they finish two years what do I give them? I give them $200. So total, they will receive about $300 cash. But where, do this cash, where does this cash come from? Actually, it's from where they have deposited with me when I collected from them as placement fee in the beginning. So actually, I held in trust <laughs> for them, but to be given back to them because I, have, I didn't plan to keep their money in the first place. But because like I told you just now, I didn't want to say, oh, I don't charge you from the very beginning, then I will appear as if I'm undercutting everybody else, right? So we give them $300 cash. Every three months, we bring all the girls out, or those who are free, for an outing to places that they will never go, actually, because it's so expensive. Singapore is just so expensive. How to afford to go to the zoo, go to uh, Sentosa, and uh, everywhere else, you know? So these are all very expensive places that they will not get a chance to go. So we bring them there all free of charge. All right. So all this will cost money. Uh, usually budget about twenty to thirty dollars per head, uh, and every time we would have at least hundred to hundred twenty participants. And all this money come from the placement fee that I collected in the beginning. Uh, they also get uh, birthday presents. They, every year we also have a big. New Year party, uh, Christmas party. Uh, maybe at this point, this is where I just explained to you, just a slight diversion. This is when I have an, a great opportunity to invite a Myanmar pastor who can come and during an occasion like Christmas, and that is the perfect time, you know, for them to share, for the pastor to share with them the, the Christmas story, yeah, uh, without being sounding too preachy. Yeah? So these are uh, little things that we do. All right, so yeah, these are some of, among other things that we do to, to take care of their, their welfare. Uh, uh, and this is in addition, this is just from the, maybe we can just say monetary terms, but uh, beyond that, uh, what is more intangible? Uh, what is more intangible? That's why I cannot provide you any KPI. The KPI is when the girl comes running to you, uh, running out from the employer's house in tears, you know, and uh, she has nowhere to go, nobody to help her. You know, and uh, we are there for her. And that is my KPI. Matthew, you had some um, 
stories to share where you really had to step in in some of these difficult cases? I was uh, hoping that you don't ask that question. But I will share with you one question, one, one case, uh, because it, it is the most difficult one that I had, and I, I still remember it until today. Uh, this girl was deployed to a family to take care of two elderly. Uh, she's trained as a nurse aide, actually, so she, she knows what she's doing. Uh, but the moment she stepped into the house, she discovered she had to take care of two very sickly elderly. And they had no time to cook. She has no time to cook. So every day, tapao. So she's always hungry, not enough food to eat. And she has to take care of a very difficult patient. One time, she was so hungry, she took biscuit from the, fam the kitchen, caught by the employer. She was accused of being a thief and all the unkind words to her. And uh, even after one of the elderly passed away, she had to continue to take care of the other one. And for this almost uh, nine months, although she was promised uh, to, to have a day off every week, every, every month, once a, once a week, every month, sorry, blah, 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 sorry, once a month, all right? Uh, basically, the uh, employer kept her in, in the lock and she couldn't go out, all right? So it was uh, so bad, she called us, I had to visit the family, and the family actually, the, the, the employee actually stood at the door, locked the door, and he told me, James, I paid you your agency fee. This is nothing to do with you, please go away. All right, and that was a response. And she was right, because that is the law. The helper is totally under her care, control, and custody. Actually, it's none of my business. Strictly speaking, if you say contractually speaking, we don't. <laughs> contractually speaking, that is true. Yeah, but we persevered. We went back again to talk to her, and uh, the poor girl was at great distress. And uh, one day, she just couldn't take it, and she had an opportunity. She ran out of the house, and then uh, she came to me. All right, so we had to negotiate her her, her, her return of her belongings and negotiate for her to go back to to Myanmar. When she went back to Myanmar, she had to undergo six months of counseling, you know, psychiatric counseling, uh, to help her unravel the trauma in her brain, you know, in her mind, you know. Uh, so that was very painful for her and even for us. Uh, and it was very painful. It cost us a lot of money too, you know. But of course, the employer was blissfully ignorant about all these things. And it's painful, but thank God that today she has fully recovered, yeah. Uh, but I never had a case so bad uh, since then. Yeah? But I'm sure there are others uh, which uh, have not come my way. But that was the, the worst case I've encountered. Yeah? I think there are real issues. We are bringing in foreign workers to do uh, jobs which uh, they may not be trained for. Okay. A lot of it because of agency fees. We, on the advocacy level, I do think we have to rethink uh, and uh, rework agency fees. Mm. You see, uh, a big part of the problem is uh, the agency fee may be paid in their home country, and we have very little jurisdiction over that. So if you imagine me, I'm a welder in uh, India or Bangladesh, and I earn two to 300 Singapore dollars a month doing welding uh, in some dangerous construction firm back in my home country. And then you come along as an agency, hey, you pay me 10,000 Singapore dollars. You can go to Singapore and work and earn $600. Though my $200 in India is very little, I'm not about to give up $10,000 to come here for the sake of welding in Singapore for a little bit more money. So what happens, I imagine, is that recruiters will go to very desperate places, tornadoes, cyclones, earthquakes, uh, droughts and ask a person who is earning no money, what to sell your house, raise $10,000, give to the agent, somebody, and then come to Singapore and be a welder. This poor man who has never left his home village, never been to a big Indian city, or now comes to Singapore and be a welder uh, or low skill or something like that. So there's this mismatch going on. And part of the pain for me is that this, this lack of efficiency, right? If there is a, a free market of labor, then this shouldn't happen. So in the next few years, one of the changes that I hope COVID will force us to is to question, okay, 
how do we overcome agency fees and hiring fees when it's not in our control, not within our national laws? Okay, and that alone gives so much pain to so many people. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, no, like, you, you mentioned this, right? Like, you know, mm. uh, but you know, um, a couple of years back, uh, one of our health serve uh, uh, key volunteers in our team tried something with another friend of ours, uh, ethical recruitment. And really, uh, you know, this is so difficult. And we have so much to learn from you, James. But, you know, uh, and it's a very complex web. Uh, and one of the things I think we can do post-COVID, I realize is apart from the migrant workers or the, or the people who, who are suffering most, we also need to then engage uh, the employers uh, more actively because, uh, you know, if we can influence them, we can, because they are also people made in the image of God and very often, uh, you know, they're also bound by practices that they don't know. We can introduce uh, fresh perspectives for them uh, and, and, you know, maybe even mentor them in business practices, for example. Why not? Is it possible? Uh, or even, so, so I think there, there are so multiple ways of doing it. And I, again, I think employers is one group that we really need to engage. This is a central issue that is not just a Singapore issue, but it's something in the labor market, especially for this kind of uh, cheap foreign labor. Um, perhaps, of course, we need Christians to start new ventures, new businesses actually to deal with this. And this is a complex problem, it's something that spans across multiple countries. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, and I think some of these questions also coming from people who may be a bit younger, uh, thinking about their careers, thinking about their uh, life choices in terms of profession. Um, so earlier on, um, I think Brother Layong, you mentioned that uh, what makes a good job is if the job is done good. And also, um, some people are thinking about working for passion, versus working for pragmatic concerns. So there are all of these issues that come up and I think they, they just are looking for some clarity on how do they make their choices. I mean, uh, today we're talking about doing good in the marketplace. So perhaps a, a kind of a framework or a way to think about this, right? Choosing, uh, it, writing, uh, or having the tension between passion as well as um, as doing good business, doing well in your career, and those are not mutually exclusive, I'm sure. Uh, again, I use stories to describe because there are so many of you out there and we come from so many different backgrounds. I remember climbing up a mountain, it was uh, tough, hot, and then round around the corner of this rocky mountain, I saw a lady farming. It was dry, a lot of stones on the ground, it was planting corn, and then I went up to her and because uh, we started talking and I asked her, can anything grow here? And then she said, something will grow. I dig, I water, I go down to the riverside, I carry mud up, I put compost, something will grow. And uh, one of the realities that we have to ask is when we enter the marketplace, I mean, I teach in a university now, and again, we, we think that, wow, you see, my oyster is out there. Just get out there and do your job, and you get your ex, and you're on the way up. It's tough. It is tough. And I always had this picture of this lady planting on this rocky slope. But sweat. You see, I carry water from down there. I carry uh, the river mud. I compose, something will grow. And I was about to go away. And then she said, that's not enough. I said, what do you mean by not enough? She says, I do not grow enough just to eat. I must grow enough seed for next year. And I think that is the good soil that we talk about. Wherever you are, ask the Lord. You know, your skills, your best skills, your best passion to meet a need, the deepest need of the world and work on it. But don't work alone. Don't work alone. I mean, part of the joy of me 
sitting beside Dr. Go Weidong on this uh, webinar is that we didn't work alone. The church, the family, the fellowship, okay, gatekeepers, don't work alone. Okay, don't be a lone ranger. Okay, be vulnerable, open up, ask questions. We're not here to succeed. We're here to glorify God. We're here to worship Him. We make the job better by bringing the values of trust, of prayer, of gratitude into very tough situations. Okay, and this is what I hope that uh, we can think about. You know, that there is families in justice. So when a great commission was given, Jesus said, "Go, you know, and teach." At that time, there was no church. It was not, not go bring people into the church, but the church is so important that as we go, we are really teaching, discipling people, making them sensitive to the heart of God. And in our different areas of the marketplace, our different generations where you are, think about it. Right? The gifts that God has given you, hone them, work on them, rejoice in them, and bring it out to be solid. Right? And maybe can I speak as a boomer? Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the greatest joy I have, and the line will know this, and James also, is that all the, the young people who work, who come to us, uh, wanting to change the world, and, and that's really uh, some a joy that we have. Um, so I think for boomers, you know, I think one, one thing we can do is to really encourage the younger generation. They are the ones, uh, you know, who are doing lots of uh, uh, advocacy, uh, giving their lives out for Jesus. And I think uh, we can encourage them uh, and also learn from them. Uh, like recently, I know some young people who also were very involved with this movement called uh, Welcome in My Neighborhood. Uh, uh, a group of young people, and I was uh, invited uh, to, to share on the panel. And they're all run by some 20 something year olds, you know. And, uh, on the panel, uh, I mean, a few of us, I was a, the, the only uncle there. And uh, uh, there were two migrant brothers. And so it was really nice. So I think, uh, you know, I encourage all uh, our seniors here to encourage uh, the younger ones. Give them the space. I think we really need to let them lead even because uh, we, we are too much uh, holding on to, to many organizations. Even the organizations, uh, the organizations we found, uh, you know, we should, uh, be able to let go hold it uh, lightly, be generous, and then allow space uh, for the younger generation to grow and to grow their leadership. I think James, you wanted to to rest. Oh, brother Lyong, you have something you're burning to say. Yes. Right? Hold the hand. I, I'm great. We don't brought this idea of uh, boomers and uh, the generation again. It's wonderful. So we're in this very tough situation now. And then the government launches all these traineeships. And I call up my friends, people who have small businesses, who are business leaders, say, hey, look, launch this, take advantage of this, take on these trainees and be their mentors. And I said, this is your Christian witness. This is a time where uh, you as a wine seller, of wine, wow, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Whatever your career is that you have built on, you are expert on niche. You know, I once spoke to a man and he was like, no, there's nothing much to do now. Nothing much to do now. I don't have a university degree. And I asked him, what do you do? And this is Amokyo. He says, oh, I used to work in China. I said, what do you do in China? He said, oh, I was involved in building the first nuclear power station in China. I say, man, you have so much things to teach us. <laughs> say, no, 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 no. I say, wow. You know, so all across, we have now in this time of, of structural unemployment, pick up the, men, the, the concept of being a mentor, pick up these schemes that the government is throwing up. And there will be many forms to fill. Okay, trust me, I, I, I fill out forms for three teams already to be trainees, to, to try and bid for this government traineeship. And I'm going to be with them for the next six months and hone their skills. And it is a privilege. This is sort and light again. Brother James, I think you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, I just wanted to add to 
what Wu Flyong and Wei Long said. I think it was exactly who said that uh, if you enjoy what you are doing, you don't have to work for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. And the passion for any work or ministry is something that God puts into your heart. You don't have to go and look for it. And I, I, I don't think I go and look around and okay, one day I say, I think I should be a mid agent <laughs> or something. No, it is always God is the uh, work in a very mysterious way. God puts us where we should be most effective and where we can bloom and serve his purpose. So if anybody is looking for a ministry, that is very simple. You just listen to the voice of God and ask God, God, where do you want me to be? You know, rather than where do I want to be? You know, God knows what you can do and God knows what you cannot do. Now we are just uh, moving into the last uh, about 15 minutes of our dialogue with our speakers. And you can, you can continue to keep the questions coming in. Um, but I just want to also try to consolidate what we have been hearing and ask our three speakers um, after today's discussion, what are some of the takeaways that you hope uh, our participants and listeners uh, will go away with, right? I mean, certain practical things that you can do and think about. And I'm, I'm sure of the many participants most, right, are probably employees of, of sorts. Uh, they work in jobs that may not be obviously related to all this justice and righteousness. Oh. So, so how can they think about these issues, right, in their daily life, especially at work? Just give you a few seconds to collect your thoughts there. I can see the, the excitement. Uh, <clears throat> if you don't mind, let me read to you a short little poem from this guy called Paul Gilbert. He says, you are writing a gospel, a chapter each day. By the deeds that you do, by the words that you say, people read and write. Read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? We touched on this uh, briefly just now. I think we don't put it very beautifully. You know, when, when people ask you, why do you do what you do? I think that is the golden moment for us to express what is in our heart. Um, I'm sure Lai Yong and Wei Long, they all agree that we are no heroes. We are not some self-sacrificing heroes who have given up wealth and fame, you know, to serve God in some remote places, you know. We are just responding to what God calls us to do. Basically, we are just trying to be disciples of Christ, right? And uh, we are writing a gospel. Um, and uh, I remember this phrase, right? It said, you, you, you can preach a gospel, you know? Uh, by all means, preach a gospel, but when necessary, use words. Right? Very often, we try to preach the gospel and uh, talk to so many people, yeah? But when, when the helpers on a Sunday come to me, most of them are not Christians, they are Buddhists, you know. And they know that I'm a Christian, they know that I don't claim to be a Christian company, but they know that we are Christian. And they, will know, and they know that we are doing this because we love them. Because we do things that nobody else does that for them. Nobody cares for them, you know. Nobody helps them, you know. And nobody uh, treats them with respect and dignity. And that's when they start asking, if not with their mouth, at least in their head, and they ask, why are you doing this? Exactly what William had experienced. I think that is the greatest joy uh, that we have experienced, you know. That we don't even have to go around preaching the gospel and fall. I can't speak Myanmar for nuts, <laughs> you know, not even a single phrase, you know. But without speaking their language, and they know that we are Christians. They know that we love them because God loves us. And we're just simply sharing the love of Christ with them. But once a year, of course, we have a chance that we get a a Myanmar pastor to articulate the same concept to them, you know, but the rest of the year, they're just seeing us Christians in action, right? So that will be our, my thought uh, to, to everybody, you know, that we are sharing the gospel. We're not just trying to be social justice warriors, you know, we're just simply Christians trying to be disciples of Christ and living out the love of Christ in our lives. Uh. One of the things I celebrate about being in Singapore is that uh, 
we must be the only country in the world where the government has uh, put in money and emphasis on lifelong learning. Okay, uh, we used to have this idea that you speed up and get your qualification, work very hard, peak at forty years old, and then after that, you know, uh, if possible, live on a several sources of passive income. Uh, but God is a learner and we are learners. I think one of uh, the avenues of being a Christian witness in the marketplace is that we learn together. I always think that you serve best when you are learning and but it's not in the vacuum, right? I'm in a university, I don't want you to be an ivory tower. You serve best as you are learning and then you learn best when you are serving. Okay. And this is to me sort and light. This is to me marketplace. Okay. That you learn best when you serve and you serve best when you learn. Okay. In sales, in uh, leadership, in stats, this comes together. And I hope that tonight uh, we will go away one thing to be disciples again. Disciples is a verb. Disci disciples is an action thing. Uh, I've been reminded reading Ephesians 5 and 6. Uh, we are so used to segmenting the Bible. Ephesians chapter 4 is about ethics, okay? Uh, speak well, work well. Ephesians 5 about uh, uh, love your husband, submissive, don't expect your children, work unto the Lord. Then Ephesians 6 about spiritual warfare it's so segmented no actually ephesians 5 and 6 now to me is this beautiful verse that we submit to christ and we submit to one another and so paul highlights three foundational relationships on earth one husband and wife two parents children three employees employers it's all unto the lord so in the marketplace we bring our values of submission, our love of the family into the job. You ask the migrant workers, why are they doing this? Many of them will say, I work many, many hours in the hot sun because I send my money back to my mommy. I love my mommy. So in Singapore, because of a corporate way, we tend to be shy about bringing our family values into the workplace. Maybe we hang one photograph, that's all. Be brave about it. Okay bring the family love into the marketplace and the reverse is true uh, i'm surprised that many of my undergraduates do not really know what their fathers or mothers do they certainly don't know how much they earn so they have no idea about their family budget i don't think this is very healthy so the father's role to pray for the son is not just to pray that exam results be good it's to pray the reality of the workplace in the family, the challenges, the issues, the ethics. We don't burden children with all sorts of uh, uh, gory details, but we just have to teach them that they must be uh, harmless as doves, but wise as the serpent in our prayers together as family. So these things come together, and this is spiritual warfare. It is not some just limited to demonization and things like that. Okay, And I, I once had a class where this is university, uh, to understand Singapore history, I went down to the cemetery, Bukit Brown. And because of, a, of timing, my students are from different faculty, and we can only go at night. And then surprisingly, it was a Christian parent who challenged me, said, how can you bring students into this spirit-filled place? I said, well, I think gentle way, no, no, no spirit. Ah. Oh. Right. So Jesus in us, he's our Lord. He takes us out of the world. He will never lose us. He sends us back into the world, but we are not of the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, you know, uh, I think for me, uh, uh, seems like the three of us, uh, James, Larry, myself, we, one of the things uh, I think is common is that we are always learning uh, and we're in this together. And, you know, we learn much more from the people we serve, isn't it? Uh, I'm sure you know uh, all of you will, will agree, and so I think one thing that I take away is uh, that before we can give, we need to learn how to receive. Uh, 
I think, um, you know, learn how to receive from the people we serve, from our migrant workers uh, or from our, our domestic helpers. Uh, and we learn how to receive values, uh, gifts, uh, help from them, as, even as we give. So I think we're in this together. And I think COVID has really taught us that we're in this together. And we've got different gifts for each other. Um, and of course, uh, to do this, you know, and then if, even with younger people or people with of the different generations, I think we have to give so much to give to each other only when we are able to receive. Because that requires uh, coming from a posture of humility uh, and, and, you know, other person-centeredness. And I think, uh, so the verse that comes to my mind all the time is that because we are sometimes so fixed is, uh, 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 I think, you know, the, the verse that comes to mind is uh, Romans 12, uh, 12, 2, right? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's just constant transforming, you know? It never stops, it's always transforming. Uh, so that we can discern uh, what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And I think when we do it together, uh, pretty much the ex chapter 2 church or the early church, uh, it can be a really wonderfully rich uh, journey. Yeah, so, uh, you know, one that's uh, life-giving. And we can really flourish uh, with all the different people, the different uh, uh, ethnic groups, uh, people of different social status and, and generations in our community. Well, um, thanks for sharing with us on this topic. I think we've had a lot of takeaways. Uh, and I might share just one or two points from myself. I think maybe for a lot of you who tune in, uh, maybe you may have come looking for certain marketplace strategies or certain frameworks, but I think we, we came away with a few principles and a few thoughts that are a lot more worthwhile, right, than just, okay, what should I do and how should I uh, do good in business in a very specific setting. So one of the things we looked at was a covenantal way of thinking about our relationships with others, especially uh, some of these vulnerable communities, right, especially if we are employers ourselves. Um, a relational framework and that is so important to think about how we relate to others in life um, and especially for the Singaporeans in this um, in this chat today we do know that in Singapore we tend to do a lot of things very contractually and very legally and this is something uh, for us to learn another thing also that I think came up from amongst our speakers is the idea of uh, whatever they do whether it's a business or NGO or whatever kind of setting is basically an expression of their discipleship journey an expression in the form of serving right um, and then when, when when serving it is not so much um, helping someone from a position of superiority right but serving and even learning from the people that are being served and finally a very important point i think brought up by brother layong about the family and how um, sometimes we tend to be shy about bringing some of these things into um, the, the uh, marketplace and into our workplace but how it's so important as believers to believe that, that God has created the family as a fundamental unit of society and of life right? for us to be able to bring a bit of the element of uh, the family and how this reflects in our faith in God, right? the triune God as community, Father, Son and Holy Spirit as well. So thanks a lot. Thank mm -hmm. you.